Hello, I'm Carlos del Castillo. I'm a journalist who covers uh, technology. And today I will be moderating this session with Ben Tarnoff, who is a tech worker, a writer, and also the co-founder of Logic Magazine. Uh, before we start, I want to thank you, the CDN Fest, for making this conversation possible and inviting me here today um, to what I think is one of the best meetings about democratic uh, technologies here in Spain. Uh, and I want to thank you for sure, Ben, uh, for joining us in this conversation about the deprivatization and democratization of the Internet. I'm personally quite excited um, to welcome you here to Barcelona. I have read your book, and I must say that it's quite interesting everything you discuss uh, related why Internet is so broken now. I think uh, what you write ab uh, about is something that many people can relate to, because over the past 10 years, we have seen the emergence of uh, big tech monopolies, the proliferation of disinformation and manipulation in social media, uh, and the general polarization of uh, Internet. And in your book, you go through the, how the privatization of the network has formed and shaped this internet. And the result is uh, the internet we have today that treats people like commodities uh, from which data is extracted and sold. Uh, this data is used, um, to, is used to market market products uh, to individuals and position them primarily as consumers uh, rather than individuals with uh, legal rights. Mm. Uh, further and more dangerous, um, is that very structure of the internet that has helped uh, to spread far-right ideology and conspiracy theories uh, around the world. With all this in mind, uh, it's clear that the internet is broken, and today Ben is going to explain to us how the um, uh, academic network that the internet once was uh, what got privatized and why uh, it has allowed all these problems to happen. Uh, after that, I will discuss uh, some questions with him, and um, we will have also some questions and, and answers with the answer um, audience. Uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks for that. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Is this working? All right. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Laura, Angela, and everyone at Desadim for making this event possible and for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here in Barcelona, which is such a lovely city. Uh, and to Carlos for joining me today, and to all of you for joining. I know it's been a long day. Uh, you've seen a lot of interesting presentations and conversations. So I'll try to make this as lively as a presentation as possible, a um, bit constrained by the subject matter. The internet is not always the liveliest material, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, as, as Carlos indicated, um, drawing on the material in my recently published book. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Uh, I'm a terrible salesman. This is my, my obligatory promotion. Um, and I'm going to talk in particular about how the internet was created, how it was commercialized, where its problems come from, and how we might begin to solve those problems. So that's a lot in 20 minutes. <laughs> we'll see how much we can do. And then, of course, we're going to open it up for a broader conversation. And I'm very keen to hear how you're thinking about these issues. So I thought I'd start by reflecting a bit on where the contemporary conversation about the internet is. You can see I'm very good at making slides. Um, I don't know if this is a term that is in popular circulation in, in Europe or what the translation might be, the tech clash. Uh, is this a term people have encountered before? This is a self-selecting group, so, so probably more of you will have. But uh, in the United States, at least, this refers to the fact that over the past several years, particularly since 2016, we've seen a growing public recognition uh, that there are very serious, even fundamental problems with the internet. Uh, of course, activists and scholars have been ringing the alarm for a long time, but uh, what we've seen, again, really since 2016, 2017, is that tech critique has become much more mainstream. And the tech lash is a kind of unlovely word, but is the shorthand we use to describe this phenomenon. My sense, and you should correct me uh, if I'm wrong, is that th there is a, a longer history of a, a more critical posture towards tech uh, in a European context, so there's perhaps less of a sharp discontinuity here than there, there is in the United States. 
But it's safe to say that in the United States, and, and perhaps also in Europe, this is another one of my wonderful slides, um, that the idea that the internet is broken has become a new common sense. The premise of my book is that yes, the internet is broken, and it's broken because it's a business, which is to say the crises that have provoked the tech lash are inextricable from the fact that the internet is owned by private firms and run for profit. We have an illustration of that here. Uh, these are all stock photographs, of course. So the annihilation of our privacy, severe inequalities in broadband access, the exploitation of app-based workers, the proliferation of reactionary propaganda on social media, these diverse forms of social damage facilitated by the internet, to name just a few, wouldn't exist if they weren't profitable. But the internet wasn't always a business. It had to be made into a business. And my book is mostly about that history, the history of how the internet was made into a business. And this occurred through a process of privatization. This process not only created the modern internet, it also, in my view, set in motion the crises that have provoked the so-called tech lash. The tech lash, I think, is best understood as a belated reckoning with the legacies of the internet's privatization. So what do I mean by privatization? Because this is a term that we have to be a little bit precise with, because it can mean different things to different people. Here, I think a little bit of backstory on the internet is useful. And I apologize if some of this history may be familiar to you. So the internet starts out in the 1970s as an experimental technology that is created by US military researchers. In the 1980s, it grows into a US government-owned computer network, really a network of networks, an internetwork, that is, by the end of the 80s, used primarily by civilian academics at universities across the country and some overseas, although it's, it's primarily in the United States. And then in the 1990s, privatization began. Now importantly, the privatization of the internet was a process, not an event. It did not involve a simple transfer of ownership from the public sector to the private, but rather a more complex movement where corporations programmed the profit motive into every level of the network. And through this process, a system that had been built by scientists, by researchers, was renovated for the purpose of profit maximization. Now, as you can imagine, this was a pretty difficult task. This took interventions at a variety of levels, software, hardware, legislation, entrepreneurship. It took decades, and it touched all of the internet's many pieces. Now, before moving on, we should talk briefly about what those pieces are, because to talk about how the internet was privatized, we need to define what the internet is. And that's actually not so easy. You'd think that an infrastructure that is so essential to our lives as the internet could be defined relatively concisely, but it, it's challenging to do. If you Google image search for the internet, for instance, which is usually how I try to understand what something is, I plug it into Google image search, which is a terrible way to start, uh, you get something like this. Actually, a lot of pictures like this of globes with flashing lights, which is not actually so helpful. So what is a better starting point? A better starting point, I think, is to say that the internet is fundamentally a language. It's a language that lets different computer networks talk to each other and thus interconnect to form a global network of networks. Many of you may know that concretely what this means is that the lang this language exists as a protocol. Now, a suite of protocols called the TCPIP protocol suite. But that basic concept of the internet as a language, I think, is a useful one. Now, that, I think, is fairly easy to grasp. But what gets complex is that the structures across which this language is spoken are so vast, so complex, exist at so many different scales, how can we possibly visualize them as a whole? And this, I think, is where metaphors are useful. One metaphor that is, is very common in, in computing circles and I think is particularly useful for thinking about the internet is the stack, a metaphor I'm sure many of you have, have encountered before. And a stack is simply a set of layers piled on top of each other. This is a diagram, of course, of a house. In a house, you might have a basement, a first floor, a second floor, all the way up to the roof. 
And the things that you do further up in the house often depend on systems that are located further down. So this is actually a plumbing diagram of a house. So if you take a shower, a water heater in the basement uh, warms up the cold water that's being piped into your house and pipes it up to your bathroom. Now the internet also has a basement and its basement also largely consists of pipes. Everything you do up the stack depends on these pipes working properly. More specifically, the basement of the internet consists of things like this. this I found the ugliest photo I could find. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, very pretty pictures of data centers on the internet. So I had to dig to find this one. There's a, there's a subreddit called Cable Porn, which is mostly data center technicians sharing usually very nice, but in some cases very hideous pictures of server racks. So uh, yeah, I found just the grossest thing I could find. Um, but you know, this is what the basement of the internet looks like. Fiber optic cable, racks, routers, um, big cables that run uh, across the floor of oceans, across continents. And the purpose of all this machinery is to ensure that all of the different networks that compose the internet, which are bound together by that language, by that set of protocols, can talk to one another. And the reason we're talking about the pipes is because the process of privatization began here, in the basement with the pipes. And this happens in the 1990s. So that's why we're going to look at a bunch of photos of Bill Clinton using the internet. This is actually a selection. There are dozens of really good photos of Bill Clinton using the internet online, which you can find. I made a, a, a particular selection of my favorites, but, and there are a lot of them in my presentation. Um, now, it's important to note here, before we get into the story, that privatization didn't come out of nowhere. It was the plan all along. The federal government had no intention of running the internet indefinitely. But privatization ends up happening quite fast and takes a particularly extreme and comprehensive form. By the early 1990s, the internet was still under the control of the federal US government, but it was under the National Science Foundation, which is a US federal agency tasked with supporting basic research, and was used, still as I pointed out earlier, primarily by academic researchers. But the increasing popularity of the internet pushed the National Science Foundation to make the transition to privatization sooner than expected, because more and more people wanted to get online, um, so they needed greater capacity, and privatization was widely seen as the only way to make the medium mainstream and attract the kind of investment that would be needed to meet that demand through expanded capacity. Now this privatization ends up taking an especially extreme form thanks to extensive industry influence over the process and the broader ideological climate of the 1990s, which we have to remember is defined by the free market triumphalism of Clintonism on the one hand and Newt Gingrich's Republicans in Congress. Gingrich in particular becomes kind of a poster boy of techno-libertarianism, which is a history that we may be uh, interested in, in revisiting in the Q&A. So the result is that a network that was created at enormous public expense was fairly quickly and quite completely ceded to the private sector. To give you a sense of the scale of this move, the internet was brought into existence through decades of public funding and public planning. Not only did the basic technology have to be invented, but the infrastructure had to be built, specialists had to be trained, contractors had to be staffed, funded, and in some cases directly spun off from US government agencies. And strikingly, the privatization of the pipes in the 1990s comes with no conditions. The US federal government would not preserve any kind of real public foothold in the new internet or mandate any portion be set aside for non-commercial uses or prescribe any rules dictating how the new owners of the internet's core infrastructure, the so-called backbones, uh, ran their networks. Now, there was nothing in the technical composition of the internet that predetermined this kind of extreme privatization. Throughout the book, I try to point out that there were always alternative proposals that were put forward at these different junctures of history. In particular, there was a proposal uh, in the form of a Senate bill put forward by Senator Daniel Inouye that would have created what was called at the time a public lane on the information superhighway. The information superhighway being a term that sounds a bit antiquated in 2022, but was, a, was the preferred metaphor at the time for talking about 
the internet. And this proposal would have reserved a portion of capacity for non-commercial uses, not unlike uh, what had happened with radio and television in the past. The idea that, well, there's a certain amount of spectrum, we're gonna put a portion of it aside for non-commercial uses. Um, but there wasn't a social movement capable of generating enough pressure to implement these ideas against industry opposition. So what happens is in April 1995, this is a key inflection point in the privatization of the internet, the US government decommissions the NSFnet, which had been the core NSF-run backbone of the internet up until that point, and the private sector took over. Further deregulatory moves over the course of the 90s and into the early 2000s would further entrench private sector control and lead to what we have today in the United States, which is a highly concentrated market in internet service. I think this is my last photo. It was hard to choose. There were a lot of good ones. I said before that uh, the privatization of the internet was a process, not an event. And that what privatization did was to program the profit motive into every level of the network. At the level of the pipes, the source of profit was rather straightforward. It was monetizing access, making money from getting people online, internet service provider model, or from operating the deeper networks. But the real money didn't lie in monetizing access, but in monetizing activity. That is not helping people get online, but making money from what they did once they got online. So the next phase of privatization was to ascend to the upper floors of the internet, to the layer where the internet is experienced. And just to return to our uh, plumbing diagram here, let's see. Just look at Bill Clinton. Oh, you hear me now? Okay. I'll just keep this up for a while. Oh, there we go. Okay, we're back to our plumbing diagram. So we were in the basement, and now we're going to move up to the upper floors of the house. And uh, I apologize if this is too simplistic for some of you. I know there are, there are many technical experts in the audience, but I found this is a helpful way to think about it. So moving up the stack, we come to the application layer, to where we experience the internet through apps and sites and so-called platforms. So how could one maximize profit at this layer of the internet? This was the central focus of the dot-com boom that began with Netscape's explosive IPO in August 1995. You may recognize Mark Andreessen, a much younger Mark Andreessen, it should be said, on the cover of Time magazine uh, in 1995. Andreessen, of course, is one of the founders of Netscape, uh, the company that created really the first popular graphical web browser. Um, so over the, the years following this very big IPO in August 1995, tens of thousands of startups are founded and hundreds of billions of dollars are invested in them. And yet the profits mostly fail to materialize. As Ed Horowitz, who was the CEO of Viacom at the time, explained in 1996, the internet has yet to fulfill its promise of commercial success. Why? Because there is no business model. So he's exaggerating slightly, but for the most part, this is true. And the absence of a viable business model was made particularly evident, of course, by the implosion of the dot-com bubble in 2000 and 2001. Now, there have been a lot of post-mortems, both then and since, about why did the dot-coms fail. But my view is that the real problem was structural. The dot-coms were, when they wouldn't have thought about it in these terms, but they were trying to advance the next stage of the internet's privatization by pushing privatization up the stack. But the structures that would make such a push feasible were not yet in place. Those structures were actually built in the aftermath of the dot-com bust, when a new set of complex computational systems begin to be built. They would come to be known as platforms, but that's a word I'm gonna take some issue with because I think what they most resemble are shopping malls. Shopping malls. We have a lot of these in the United States. Hopefully we don't have too many in, in Spain. Um, when we think of Google, Facebook, Uber, and Amazon, 
I think we should think of them as the online equivalents of, sh as sh of shopping malls. Online malls are corporate digital enclosures with a wide range of transactions and interactions transpiring inside of them. And in particular, I think they have these characteristics. Online malls are middlemen. They facilitate interactions. Those could be interactions between buyers and sellers, between searchers and websites, between customers and service workers. These interactions can be commercial, just like in a real mall, or social, just like in a real mall. Uh, I don't know how many American teenagers you know, but many of them spend their social lives in like the food court of, uh, of their suburban shopping mall, right? So malls have become very social spaces as well, just like online malls. Online malls are also sovereigns, which is to say they write the rules for those interactions. They don't, as companies like to pretend, just sit back and let the interactions occur. They're intimately involved in governing and shaping those interactions. They are, of course, the maker and beneficiary of network effects. They benefit from having more and more people interact within the walls of the digital enclosure. And finally, and, and crucially, because this is the breakthrough, they are the manufacturer prefer to talk about data as something we manufacture rather than capture, because it's not something that exists out in the world. It's a computational process that creates something uh, that wasn't there before. They are the manufacturer and monetizer of data. All of these interactions that are happening within the enclosure are, of course, recorded and interpreted. This is what distinguishes online malls. They are, above all, designed for making and making use of data. Now, how exactly they make the data and how they monetize it varies. We often thought, think a lot about online advertising. That's, of course, a very important and very lucrative business model, particularly for Google and Facebook, but is by no means the only way that data is converted into money. So there is considerable variation in the business models, in the technical composition, but these are the main characteristics. And I think these characteristics of these systems is what enabled privatization to be pushed up the stack in the 2000s and 2010s, to ascend from the basement to the upper floors of the house, if you like, and thereby for the immense profit potential of the internet to be realized. So what is the legacy of all of this? It's a big question, right? What have been the consequences of reorganizing the internet around the principle of profit maximization? So let's focus briefly, and I, I'll be brief in this latter portion because I know I'm running low on time. Let's focus briefly on the pipes of the internet, on the basement. And, and importantly, as you know, the caveat here being that the legacy varies by national context, particularly maybe at the level of the pipes because the telecom landscape varies quite widely by national context. But within the US context, uh, what we have is that after decades of deepening private control, Americans pay some of the highest rates in the world in exchange for awful service. Average monthly internet costs are actually higher in the US than in Europe or Asia, while the US ranks 14th in average connection speeds, which is below countries like Hungary and Thailand. One statistic that people often find quite astonishing is that in 2018, Microsoft researchers found that 162.8 million Americans do not use the internet at broadband speeds. That's almost half the country. Just a, a kind of mind-boggling number. And as you might expect, the disconnected and the underconnected are disproportionately rural and low income. And given how internet access has become a basic prerequisite for participation in social, economic, civic, and cultural life, this has become a real social crisis. This photo here is a woman working in the parking lot of a community center in Omaha, Nebraska, which was offering free internet service during the early stages of the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic uh, was, to some extent, continues to be a massive social crisis in the United States. Just an enormous number of people died. I think the, the extent of it is something that can be hard to communicate to people outside of the United States. Uh, and, and it laid bare a lot of profound inequalities, one of which being internet service. So why is US broadband so pitiful? It's because the high fees that are extracted from users are not being reinvest, reinvested to improve and build out infrastructure, but to enrich executives and investors through stock buybacks and dividends. So that's the pipes. When we move up the stack, to the realm of the so-called platforms, what I prefer to call 
the online malls. Uh, what has the legacy of privatization been? And, and so this is obviously a big question, and we're going to run out of time. So if I had to choose one word to describe that legacy, it would be inequality. We can say in particular that online malls are inequality machines. More specifically, they reallocate the existing distribution of risk and reward. They push risks downwards and spread them around. They pull rewards upwards and focus them in fewer hands. And they do this in all sorts of ways. This is a photograph of a protest outside of uh, Uber's headquarters in San Francisco. So one way, of course, is that they facilitate the greater exploitation of workers by making it possible to move work around while enacting labor discipline at a distance through so-called algorithmic management. They also create informational environments that algorithmically amplify racism, sexism, and other oppressions, as well as creating a very powerful distribution channel for reactionary propaganda. And they do so through their entanglements with a wider set of political, legal, and financial forces, which necessarily vary by national and regional context. So what is to be done? And this is the last portion, I promise. In the book, I make the case for deprivatization. Another, another big word on the screen. Deprivatization aims at creating an internet where people and not profit rule. In particular, it aims at creating an internet where people have the resources they need to lead self-determined lives and the opportunity to participate in the decisions that affect them. And what does that actually mean concretely? It means developing publicly and cooperatively owned alternatives to the corporate structures that can diminish the power of the profit motive and encode real democratic control. Now, there is no single model for what deprivatization looks like. In particular, the strategy is going to look different depending on what floor of that house we're talking about, because the internet looks different at the different layers. So deprivatization can't be monolithic. It can't be one size fits all. But I'll give you a concrete example of what deprivatization can look like at the level of the pipes. In the United States, there are more than 900 communities that are served by publicly or cooperatively owned broadband networks. And these so-called community networks have a number of advantages over their corporate counterparts. The first is that research shows that they tend to provide better service at lower cost. And that's because unlike their corporate counterparts, they don't exist to funnel money upwards into the pockets of shareholders. They're actually investing in infrastructure and they're also guided by a different philosophy, which is that they tend to focus on social needs, such as universal connectivity, such as the quality of connection, rather than profit maximization. And crucially, I'll just say, this is not just a matter of mission statements. It is rooted in legal mechanisms that compel community networks to function differently than private ones. For instance, by having governing boards that are democratically elected by the users themselves. And I think this latter point about democratic control is crucial because I, I don't make a fetish out of public or cooperative ownership for their own sake. The point is what types of new governance practices do those alternative ownership models make possible? To put people over profit, you need to create spaces where the people can rule. Now, I should say, of course, that community networks are by no means a US-specific phenomenon. Uh, we could talk about a number of initiatives here. I know there, there have been folks uh, from uh, guifi.net here, uh, which, which I, I've been hearing about today. Uh, we could also talk about the Fifunk initiative in Germany, um, the Federation FDN in, in France. There are a number of examples in a European context and indeed in beyond a European context, which I, I hope you'll tell me more about. But I think they share the basic spirit and principles of the community networks that we have in the United States. Now, of course, community networks are, are confined to the pipes of the internet. Up the stack among the so-called platforms, the path to deprivatization is less linear. But I'd like to give you uh, a kind of two-pronged strategy here. The first is that we need to shrink the footprint of the online malls while also assembling a constellation of alternatives that can lay claim to the space they currently occupy. And these must be real alternatives, not simply more entrepreneurial or smaller versions of the tech giants, but institutions of a fundamentally different kind, engineered to curtail the power of the profit motive 
and to enshrine the practices and indeed the principles of democratic decision making. Some of these alternatives are beginning to emerge in rudimentary form. We could think of self-governing social media communities that have been developed through the decentralized web community. We could think of worker-owned app-based services that are being developed through the platform cooperativism community. But these experiments will need to be refined and expanded through public investment. We will also, of course, need spaces that help new alternatives emerge, where people can collectively articulate their needs and construct the online worlds that are capable of meeting them. The, so the, 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 the piece that I wanted to emphasize for you here is that this process of building alternative networks and services of developing, let's say, diverse experimental pathways for deprivatizing the internet has a technical component, of course. A lot of code has to be written, as, as you all know. But it's above all a political project. So I gotta give you the Barcelona photo here. And as a political project, it can draw on a rich set of traditions for inspiration. The socialist and anarchist traditions of self-management, of autonomy, of forging organs of popular power where people can collectively provision the resources they need and participate directly in the decisions that affect them. So for that reason, I couldn't resist showing you a photo of a collectivized restaurant in Barcelona during the Civil War. We have ancestors, in other words, and I take great inspiration and, and consolation from that fact. The internet is new, uh, but the principles that will help us build a better internet are not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. It was really, really interesting. I enjoyed it a lot. I have so many questions to, <laughs> that I would ask you. But um, just to link with uh, your last uh, comment, uh, I'm curious about uh, how, how, do you, how do you feel, how do you think we can uh, convince uh, the people who is comfortable in their uh, shopping malls, uh, who is OK with Instagram, who enjoys um, his uh, free YouTube, uh, uh, how we attract them to this kind of political movement to change the internet? Well, I think the, sorry, can you hear me? Not anymore. Oh, here we go. Can you hear me? I think the good news is that it's become a lot easier to have those types of conversations. It's become a lot easier for people to understand the political consequences of different technologies because there's, there's such a more developed discourse around the corrosive effects of Facebook on political culture. It didn't exist five years ago. I think if you had tried to have conversations with people about the need for alternatives five years ago, that you would have had the door slammed in your face. Whereas today, it's, it's much easier to start that conversation. People are much more aware that there are political stakes to the technologies that suffuse their lives. Um, so for that reason, I think, I think it's a, we're in a better place. But to your point, I mean, and we, we spoke about this earlier, these are tech firms that have enormous amounts of money at their disposal. So the software has a lot fewer bugs and it's a lot more usable because they have better designers and UX researchers and so on. If you've used something like Mastodon, it's a wonderful project. It doesn't work quite as well as Twitter, right? So there is obviously a resource gap, and that's why in the book, I feel that there is a need here for public investment. We need to close that resource gap somehow, and I think public investment on some scale is how we're gonna do it because at the end of the day, we can try to politicize people's relationship to technology but I think we also have to meet them where, they at, where they're at in terms of providing alternatives that are, are usable. Mm -hmm. I will ask you a lot of questions, but um, uh, I think it's um, already uh, 15 minutes uh, to finish the, the chat. So maybe we can open uh, the questions for the, for the audience. If not, I can, I can uh, ask Ben a lot of questions. I don't know if there is some questions? Yeah, um, today we talked a lot about like regulation and you didn't. Um, so my question is, uh, will it be, uh, should it be one of the tools as well? Because I, I think if I'm not mistaking, the EU is going to uh, 
like force um, chatting, like chatting app to have interoperability, which basically means that you will have a common layer for, for chatting. Can, can you imagine some sort of regulations to at least allow you to, to, to build on some sort of uh, um, public layer? Uh, I don't know if I'm expressing myself correctly, oh, but no, it you would are. be like a road. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Instead of being an, a company-owned road, you have a common road, and then you build some app on top of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up interoperability, because it's a conversation that's happening in the United States as well. And it's an interesting issue, because the question is, well, that's wonderful, but what am I going to interoperate with? Right? And I think that's where sometimes we'll part ways with people. Uh, there's a growing anti-monopoly movement in the United States that sees interoperability as a road to greater competition. So interoperability would allow more smaller, more entrepreneurial private firms to compete over providing social media services. And I, I, I mean, again, I'm, I have critical support. I'm a kind of fellow traveler of a sort with the anti-monopoly folks because I think mandating interoperability is a great idea. There's a separate question of how they're gonna do it, but they'll figure it out, technically. Um, but to my mind, what I see interoperability as being useful for is a tool to shrink the footprint of these big platforms and to be able to divert their users to non-commercial alternatives, to publicly and cooperatively owned alternatives. So I think for me, I relate to the regulatory conversation in a sympathetic but critical way. I think to my mind, if we're not talking about private ownership, if we're not talking about the profit motive, if we're not talking about capitalism, then the conversation is incomplete. Linked to uh, that question, uh, something that I was um, thinking about when I was reading your, your book, and um, uh, it's linked also as my work as journalist, is that uh, I think uh, for many people, the problems created by the privatization are, um, are very clear, but um, uh, I feel that we are not having that uh, meaningful discussions at um, a space of power. Mm. Um, we don't have a really big, uh, even if it's getting bigger, as you said, we don't really have a, a big uh, movement to mm, deprivatization of the internet. But uh, uh, the political institutions are not talking about it, are regulating the markets, as you say in the book, but not, not um, maybe thinking even uh, thinking about how, uh, how to, to make this deprivatization of internet. In fact, uh, for example, the last week um, it was the, um, um, the uh, International Telecommunications uh, held the, the selection for the new president mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was um, the, the two candidates what, what was one from, uh, was, um, from the United States and the other one uh, was from, the, from Russia. And uh, their visions of internet was uh, totally different for uh, for sure. But uh, one was this privatized internet, and the other one was the state-controlled internet uh, that Russia and China want. Who, at least in my, in my opinion, is even worse. Uh, how, how can we uh, push this kind of conversations to mm -hmm. a, space, a space of power? It's a great question. You know, one of the questions I got after writing the book was. So who are the organizations doing this work of promoting the project of deprivatization? How can I get involved? And it doesn't exist. Like, I just made it up, kind of. <laughs> it's, I think the, the thing with deprivatization is it's my attempt to provide a kind of cohesion, an ideological cohesion to different projects and initiatives that I think are all pointing in the same direction. But the participants in many of those initiatives don't see their objective as deprivatization, right? When you speak to the member owners of community networks in the United States, they would generally not speak of it in these terms. In fact, American community networks are often framed in a kind of uh, entrepreneurial, small business owner discourse of breaking down the big monopolies, right? So I, I think my, my hope with deprivatization is to give people a concept and an accompanying history of the internet that will help them build alliances between different projects and organizations that may feel very separate to them. 
to give you one example, the people who are very concerned about the proliferation of right-wing propaganda on social media are often not also very concerned about the type of severe inequalities in broadband access that I was discussing earlier. But to my mind, those are very connected. And privatization, the history and the legacy of privatization, is the connective tissue. And if you can recognize that analytically, it makes different political strategies and political coalitions possible. So that's, that's my aspiration, but I mean, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think that's a really good advice. Yeah, inspiring. Um, no questions? I can. Yes. Um, thanks for. Thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to ask you about the proposal of building the nonprofit public alternatives. Um, that I see the problem of them having to compete with the private sector that will have many more resources, all the best technicians, all the money from Silicon Valley, etc. And I see that as a very difficult task. So why not put on the agenda more a question of you know expropriation or socialization? Mm -hmm of Google, of Microsoft, et cetera, Absolutely. rather than focus on trying to build you know, public alternatives? And if, if not, why not? Or what would be the difficulties? Or how could that look? I, no, I love it. I mean, expropriate the expropriators, right? <laughs> but uh, I mean, we're in Barcelona. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think you're pointing to something which I very carefully evade in the book, because I wanted to write a book that was short, which is that to remake the internet, we have to remake everything else, which is also kind of a bummer, right? You don't want to hear that because like, oh God, it's such a big project. But the reason that I wanted to emphasize that point at the end of my presentation is that there is a technical component to this work. And I think those of us, I'm a, I work in the tech industry, those of us who work in the industry or inhabit kind of technical spaces like Desidim maybe tend to overemphasize the technical because it's primarily a political project, and it's primarily a project that has to be pursued, developed by social movements. The internet is interesting as an organizing issue. We were talking about this earlier, in that you know, I, I'm someone who, you know, my, my theory of change is very bottom up. I think to build a better internet, we need a social movement. But as people who have spent time in movement spaces know, resources are very constrained. You have to set priorities. And I would never go to a group of organizers and say, all right, the internet is the number one issue. It's, cra it's a crazy thing to say, right? Above like climate, above all these other issues. I think the way we can present the internet is that it is a component issue of every other issue. You may not care about the internet, but the internet cares about you, right? There is a climate component to the internet when we think about the energy intensivity of data centers and artificial intelligence. There is a racial justice component to the internet. All of the other issues around which we organize, the internet is integrated because the internet is integrated into all aspects of our life. So, so the hope with this book is to provide a set of concepts, a set of tools for thinking that through within the context of other organizing projects of the kind that we will need eventually to expropriate the expropriators. Thank you, and we are running off, uh, out of time. Uh, maybe one more question, if it's quick, we can do it. No? Um, I think we can finish now, or I can go on <laughs> until midnight, <laughs> if you let me. No, thank you very much uh, to all for being here today with men and uh, with me, and I hope you enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thank you.